You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Thank you so much for the family that you have given to us. Why is Jack giving the guy a blanket? Hold the door for Grandma Jack. Thank you. I got you. I got you. We thank you for the privilege that we have of serving you and to be disciples. I'm so sorry, baby girl. Let's try again, okay? Go ahead and ease it forward. It's okay. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. This morning, we begin our study of the second letter from Paul to Timothy. And to sort of set this up and give you the context the right way, I'm going to ask you to do something that actually sounds a little somber. But just for a minute, I want you to think for a second that you got some bad news and it became apparent that your death was gonna be imminent. What would you say to your children? Hmm? Because that's the context here. The context of the letter that we're starting this morning is that Paul is headed towards imminent death. I mean, it's coming quickly. And he takes the opportunity here to stop and to write his young disciple, Timothy, about some things that are really important. And I'm, I'm guessing here that when you have a moment like that, you sort of cut through the trivial. I mean, there are certain things that are just not important anymore. You're gonna get to the heartfelt things. I mean, if I'm dying, I'm 100% certain I'm not gonna talk about work. No. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about sports. I'm not gonna talk about some show I'm binge watching on Netflix. Conversations are going to be too valuable for that. Amen. Some of you have had this type of experience. Those, those, those questions, those moments, those discussions, those are sacred moments. When someone's coming to the end of their life facing death, those conversations tend to be weighty. They often come with tears. We speak about what we believe and what we hold dear to us, the memories that have been made together, the people that we love and the people that we'll miss. And we give advice, heartfelt advice. That's the context here of this second letter to Timothy. This likely happens about five to six years after Paul's first letter, it's about 66, 67 AD. This is during the first few years of Nero's persecution of the Christians. This second letter finds Paul again in prison. He happened to be there the first time he was in prison when he wrote to him, but now he's in prison all over again. But this letter is strikingly different in the fact that the first letter when he wrote it had this sense about him that he had this positive sense that he was gonna get out, he was gonna see them again, he was gonna be able to teach them and encourage them and, and, and be in their lives a little bit more. But the second letter here doesn't have any hope like that at all. There's no hope of release at all. In fact, listen to what he says here in chapter four, verses six and seven. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Those are not the words of a man who expects to be free anytime soon. Paul knew that his execution was coming quickly. Now most historians will tell you that he was in a place called Mamertine, it was a a, a prison there that was in Rome, and and it's interesting because as I looked this up on on a map and trying to figure out where everything was, I realized that this is less than 100 yards from the Roman circus. Imagine that. Imagine you get put into a prison like that and you're 100 yards from the sounds of life and, and laughter and freedom. The Maritime prison was a dungeon. 
It was underground. It was obviously not clean. It was not comfortable. And I'm not trying to be crude, but since the the formation of the latrines back then was everything flows downhill because that's the way gravity works, he was downhill. That was going to make for a smelly and a wet place. It was cold. There was no heat, no warmth. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 13, he writes and asks that someone would bring his cloak when he comes. It would also mean that during the summertime, this was going to be unbearably hot because there would be no airflow at all. The air would be completely stagnant at that point. And so here's Paul sitting in his cell in chains. He's cold. He feels completely abandoned at this point. There's no hope of being delivered. And yet here he is writing to this young protege of his, Timothy, and challenging him, encouraging him. Timothy, stay at it. He could have been like talking about, you know, this is, this is so hard and, you know, we think about when we're going through something difficult and how much we want to verbalize all of this and yet he takes his time to challenge Timothy and, and tell him, look, you got to stay at it, stay at it, go back to the ministry, get your heart right before the Lord, you know, do this with a sense of passion about you and while you're doing it, make sure you hold on to sound doctrine. Doctrine, by the way, is just another word for teaching. What he's saying is, don't just teach anything. Make sure that what you're teaching is solid. That's one of the reasons why we we feel like it's our job around here to to stay away from opinion. It's our job to stay away from, from pop culture. It's our job to stay away from politics and teach God's word, period. Thank you, four of you. All right. So Paul here is encouraging Timothy to stay strong, to avoid error, to be willing to accept the the pressure that comes from preaching the gospel, from the Roman oppression that was coming. And by the way, there was lots of oppression. Eusebius, who was an early church historian, wrote that Paul was actually crucified shortly after Rome was burned. Tacitus, who was a Roman historian and not a believer, had written a series of, of historical works called The Annals. And in the annals, Tacitus said that Nero blamed the Christians in Rome for the burning of it. But historically, the whole city knew that, that Nero himself had lit the fires. There were way too much, you know, too, way, way too many coordina- or much coordination that took place and having all the fires set at all the same times. Tacitus even tells us that Nero was so warped that he literally played the liar. Now, you've often heard before, well, I heard Nero fiddled. Well, the fiddle hadn't been invented for like, you know, 500 years until, so I don't think it it was really a, a fiddle. But his servants would later come around and say that he actually sang. He sat there and played an instrument and sang while his city burned. Like he did it for his own amusement. That's the context here that Paul writes in. Now let me read you the first eight verses so we can be on the same page as we go here. Paul writes and he says, starting in verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of that life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Now he starts off here in verse one and he tells us that he is an apostle, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle was someone who was personally chosen by Jesus. Now here, let me tell you what that means. If you were personally chosen by Jesus, that means that you had to be there when Jesus was actually walking around on the earth. Are you tracking with me here? 
So if Jesus is there and he calls you to be an apostle, you are going to be an apostle. That's why we don't have any more apostles today. Are you still tracking with me on that one? You can't just take this title. Let me show you what the requirement was. Go back to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one, go to verse 21. Now the context here is, is that the, uh, the 11 disciples, Judas, of course, you know, became the, the traitor. He's gone. The 11 disciples now are prepared to add a 12th to take Judas's place. Watch what the requirements are. Exodus, or Acts chapter one, verse 21, he says, so one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he is taken up from us, so in other words, stop for a second, there's the uh, sort of the parameters. This person had to be there when Jesus was going and doing his ministry. He has, the parameter is he had to be there from the point of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist all the way to the time when he departed in Acts chapter one and been up and was the Lord. He says, Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to the resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and the apostleship which Judas turned aside to go into his own place. And they cast lots for them and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 12 apostles. Now, that's a big deal. When he writes this passage then, back here in 2 Timothy, there's not a lot of these guys left. This is probably 33 to 34 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Paul tells us he is an apostle here, not because he chose to be. Again, this is not the kind of thing where you could go, well, listen, uh, you know, we're starting a church here, and I just think, call me apostle. No. That's not the way it worked. This was a calling. It's like God gave him an assignment. Just like It's true of us. When you and I come to faith in Jesus Christ, God also gives us assignment. It comes along with our new birth. Our assignment is is that 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 time when he sort of saves us and forgives us and pulls us into his family, that he puts us in the family business. You could be sitting there going, well, what's the family business? The gospel. The gospel is the family business. You see, it's through the gospel that I experience forgiveness. It's through the gospel that I experience new birth spiritually. It's through the gospel that I realize what my intended purpose was for being on this earth. It should have the highest priority in our lives because it is the most remarkable story ever told. Now go back to 2 Timothy here. Verse two here Timothy, uh, again, says to Timothy, or Paul says to Timothy, my beloved child, he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy, obviously, he's talking about his his spiritual DNA. This is his disciple. He's not talking about his actual son. Verse three, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Paul, I I love here what he does here. I love his commitment to praying. He says, you're constantly in my prayers. Let me tell you why that's a big deal. Years and years ago, I was much younger then, and you know, I, I remember I drew the assignment to go to this convalescent hospital and to pray with this older woman that was struggling. And I, you know, I'd found out that she was in her 90s and she couldn't walk anymore. She, she was confined to a, a bed or either a wheelchair if somebody perhaps would push her around and there really wasn't a lot of people that would do that at that point. So I get there to the hospital and I find out that not only can she not walk anymore, now she can't see. She's blind. She's in her 90s. And I'll be honest with you, at that point, I really didn't know what to say. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm supposed to go in here and I'm supposed to kind of encourage her, you know, lift her up a little bit. And I remember 
one of the most shallow questions you could possibly ask that I just looked at her and I said, what do you do all day? <laughs> I mean, I really was kind of, you know, immature and she said, I pray. I have a ministry of prayer. That was incredibly humbling. I mean, here's this woman in her 90s, she can't walk, she can't see, but she could pray and she did. I mean, when she prayed, it was so obvious that she had lots and lots of conversations with God. Just the way they conversed was amazing. I, I remember, I think, going in there thinking, I'm supposed to go in and encourage this lady. She schooled me. I mean, I thought I knew the Lord well. I went to Bible college and seminary. I thought I knew the Lord. She talks to the Lord all day long. And so when Paul writes this, he says, you were constantly in my prayers, night and day. Paul knew exactly what his ministry was. I'm praying for you. That's what I'm doing. Well, keep going here. Look at verses four and five. Verse four, he says, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. He's talking about his affection for this young disciple of his, Timothy. Verse five, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your, grand, your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you as well. So Paul here affirms the value of a godly upbringing. It was obvious he tells Timothy, it's obvious that you have a sincere faith. I see it in your grandma, I see it in your mom, and now I see it in you. But here's the question. Do you know what a sincere faith really looks like? Brendan, could you come out and help me just for a second here so I don't get my hands completely? You know, what we've got here is a simple illustration so you can make the point. This is bath bomb. How many of you ladies, you, you all know, how many of you men know what a bath bomb is? Anybody here? Okay. Women like to take a bath with a bath bomb. It kind of colors the thing up, you know, but it, it's not really super, super strong. But if, you know, you jump into the bath bomb and, and there's gonna be an orange or a red or whatever color it can be, I guarantee you at the end, it washes off, okay? It might tint something for a little while, like this shirt, you could definitely take a white shirt and tint it a little bit. But the other one here, this is dye, red dye. This one is not going to tint the shirt. This one is going to stain the shirt permanently. Permanently. Now, the reason why we did this is because I want you to understand something Faith, when you come to faith, and what makes faith sincere is not a tinting of your life. That's what religion does. People say, well, you know, I'm gonna go to church and maybe get a little bit religious and, and I'll sing a couple of songs and I'll do that stuff. You know what they're really looking for? I don't want my life changed. Just tint it a little bit, all right? That's not what we're talking about. When Paul talks to Timothy about having a sincere faith, he's talking about having a life that has been stained. Amen. It's different. It's changed. It's obvious to all. It's permanent. It's been stained by the blood of the lamb. Amen. Genuine faith is just so obvious. It shows up in my, my lifestyle. It, it shows up in how I steward my time, my talents, my treasures. That means that what I say and do reveal a sincerity of heart. Paul could see that in Timothy. Now keep going here, because in verses six through eight here, Paul is gonna challenge Timothy three different ways. The first way he's gonna challenge him here is keep using your spiritual gifts. Keep using your spiritual gifts. Look at verse six. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of your hands. Well, what reason? Well, the reason that he has a genuine faith, a sincere faith. The Paul's point is this, since you have a genuine faith, use your spiritual gifts. In other words, keep it on fire. I love the term there that he used, fan into flame. You know what that tells me? That tells me that it is completely possible to take your 
spiritual giftedness, even your spiritual zeal, and let it wither away to almost nothing. I mean, be really cold. I mean, if a guy that's a pastor at the church at one of the most significant churches there is, the church of Ephesus, has to be told to step it up, get back in the game. Timothy, you got this gift. Why are you not using it? If he has to be encouraged about it, I know I do. That each of us can allow that to happen in our lives. You know, when you and I come to faith in Christ, you know we receive a spiritual gift. That's a spiritual ability that was not there at your physical birth. A spiritual gift is one that comes at your spiritual birth. But just because we receive a gift doesn't mean we'll use it. Doesn't mean that you'll just let it go idly to waste. Paul's challenge to Timothy here is, Timothy, don't do that. It should be a challenge to us as well. Am I using my, my spiritual gifts? Some of you might be asking, what is a spiritual gift? Others might be saying, well, I don't even know that God gave me a gift. I, mean, I have no idea what it is or, or how I find out or how I use it. I mean, how do I even get started on this process? Well, you know what? We, we, we kind of prepared for that. Beginning February 10th, we're gonna have a really short class called My Best Fit. My Best Fit is all about helping you find your spiritual gift and how you can use it to serve the Lord better. Right where you're at. And I would encourage you that when the service ends today, stop by Info Central and just ask them, hey, how do I get signed up for or get the information on my best fit? Because the gift is still there. I mean, I've heard people before in the past say, well, you know, it's use it or lose it. I don't know where that's in the Bible. I mean, we're a Bible church, so I'm not gonna tell you something I think is wrong. I think the gift is still there. I think the problem is our gifts are the same way that, that, that Timothy was seen by Paul. It needs to be fanned into flame. Amen. We need to begin to use that. You know, so often it becomes an issue of, of we're just afraid to fail and we allow the fears to take over. We become unsure of ourselves and we don't wanna look weird. And, you know, most Christians go through that. We go through times in our life where we're, we're fearful, we're worried about what people might think, we're worried about what someone might say at school or, or, or what happens in the workplace or in the neighborhood. It's the reason why Paul you know, writes to Timothy and in verse seven you know, tells him, hey, you're, you, you've gotta get over this fear thing. God didn't give you a spirit of timidity, Timothy. Peter was fearful. He denied the Lord three times. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've let your spiritual life and your service grow a little bit cold. I mean, maybe the gospel is not the priority that it should be because you're afraid of failing. You need to fan into flame the gift that is within you. You need to rekindle the fire. God is not through with you yet. The truth is some of us need some prodding from time to time. Timothy needed it for all eternity. Can you imagine as Timothy stopped and he reads this parchment, then he tells him, you need to get with it, Timothy. And everybody around him going, wow, he just called our pastor out right there. Look, we want to help you find your giftedness. Please don't leave today without signing up for that class. Now here's the thing, even when you, if you do that, even if you find out what your giftedness is, you may struggle for a while just even to use it. So what? I mean, think about it. You ever see somebody that had knee surgery or a hip surgery or something like that, and immediately following the surgery, they're not running. You know, they're either in a wheelchair or they've got a walker or they're, you know, on crutches or something like that. And then therapy, they go through all that stuff and they keep exercising and then pretty soon they get to the point where they're fine. No one even knows. It's the same thing with using our spiritual gifts. 
Same exact thing. You may struggle for a while. It may be awkward for a while. Well, God's called me to, you know, to be this great encourager and to go out and really encourage people, but it's not my normal nature to do that, but I really feel like that's the gift that God has given me. And every time I do it, I seem to like fall on my face and we'll get back up again and keep going. Well, I feel like God has given me, you know, this gift of leadership, but no one seems to want to follow me. You know, well, you know what? Put yourself into a spot where you can naturally step up. It might be awkward, but get going again. God isn't through with you yet. Get back in the game spiritually. Now, specifically, what was Timothy's gifts? Well, go back over to chapter four there in 2 Timothy and look at verses two through five. Paul writes here and he tells Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. In other words, when it's convenient and even when it's not, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with, with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will, in, will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into, into myths. As for you, Always be sober-minded, enduring suffering. Do the work of an evangelist until you fulfill your ministry. And so he calls out his teaching gifts there. You're supposed to be preaching, teaching, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. And then in in verse five there, he says something very interesting. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Now, here's what that tells me. That wasn't his natural gift. He was not the extrovert we know that Peter and Paul were. This is a guy that at at one point, you know, Paul writes to him and he says, hey, Timothy, why don't you take a little bit of wine for your stomach because you're way too nervous all the time, you know? This was work for him. For Timothy to go and and to share his faith, I mean, this was not gonna be an easy thing. He would have to go and and put work in like you and I might have to do. And you you might be sitting there going, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism, so I'm not gonna share my faith. I'll leave that to people who have the gift. no. Mm -mm. when we enter into the family, the family business is the gospel. It's the thing that changed me. It's the story I'm supposed to tell to other people. Some people are just naturally gifted at it. They'll be better at it than you. It still means we do the work. Now, the second thing he's gonna tell him here is we need to keep operating in the Holy Spirit. Verse seven. Back in chapter one, he says, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So the second reason here we're not to be ashamed of Christ is when we consider the resources that God has already provided for us. He tells us here, he has not given us a spirit of timidity. I love that, you know, that song, and you know, we sang this morning, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. It lives in us. We didn't do that by accident. That was all on purpose this morning. So that you would remember the fact that the Holy Spirit is the most powerful force on earth, period. And he lives inside of you. The power that that gives us constant connection with God, the Father, the power that, that keeps us safe, the power that gives us the ability to live this life in a world full of people that maybe don't want to live the same way. The insight to see, how to get beyond my own flesh and to see how God can use me. That's God's spirit. Paul is encouraging Timothy and us, keep operating in the spirit. Do not be driven in your life by fear. Instead, be driven by God's spirit. Now, the third thing he's gonna tell us here is in verse eight. And that is that we ought to accept the consequences of being faithful. Verse eight, he says, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. You know, many believers today let the world or their own desires for for acceptance or comfort or ease or whatever the case may be, those things, we let those things dictate if and when we use our gifts. That's not what we're supposed to do. My using of my spiritual gifts should be in response of God's call in my life. Listen, 
God's salvation is not just to keep you out of hell. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The salvation that God gave you is not just to keep you out of hell. It is to transform your life. Transform your thinking. Transform your heart. It's to change you. It's to make you a true follower of Jesus, a disciple. I love what he says here in verse eight. How he starts off, he says, uses the word therefore. That means as a result of everything that I've just previously said. Paul says, get back in the game spiritually. Maybe you've grown cold. It's time to light the fire again. You know, Timothy was a good guy, a great guy. He was a faithful pastor, but he just needed a little bit of encouragement. Maybe like you and I need a little bit of encouragement. He needed to be challenged to get going spiritually. Could that be us as well? If our faith is sincere, I'm not talking about a faith that is merely tinted, that if given the opportunity to put clear water on it, it's gonna wash right out. I'm talking about a faith that is stained by the blood of the lamb. It's different. Then I ought to be proclaiming that. And so just as Timothy, I would guess, was a little bit shocked by Paul's words, I would hope that this would be your encouragement this morning to get back in the game spiritually. God is not through with you yet. This morning we're gonna take communion. This is a perfect morning for it. In fact, I'm gonna ask those people that are gonna serve as communion, if you'd go ahead and get started, you can go ahead and begin to pass those out. And when they do, I'm gonna ask you just to keep and hold that because we're gonna take that together in a few minutes. But let me explain what's going to happen here. If you're new here, if you've not been around a church or this church for a while, there are people that are gonna come around and they've got some trays and inside those trays are some cups. In fact, there's gonna be two cups, one with a little piece of bread and one with juice sitting right on top of it. Take both of them and just hold it for a minute. Just hold those. This, this is something, communion is something that Christians do. We do it because Jesus not only did it, but he told us to do it. In fact, the night before his death, he, he did this illustration with his very own disciples. As he's sitting around a meal together, he stopped and he took bread and he broke it and he passed it around to them and he says, this is like my body. It's going to be broken for you. I'm going to die. And then he took a cup that had wine in it this time. We used juice and, and, and we, he passed it around and he says, this cup represents my blood which is going to be shed for you. And at the crucifixion, there was lots and lots of blood. That illustration was to help us to see that Jesus was going to give his life for us. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that every single time we do this, we remember his death and that we're supposed to do that. And so typically, at least once a month, we stop and we do this just to remember. And the band comes and we have an opportunity to sing a little bit together. We call that worship. But really what happens is, it's a time for every single person that's sitting here in the seat to do an evaluation of their life. See, there's three possibilities here. One possibility is, you know what? You are this person right here. You're stained by the blood of the lamb. You believe it. You are sold out. But maybe like Timothy, you just need a little bit of motivation to restart that fire and get it going again and you're ready. You're ready. The second possibility is you might be here this morning and you don't believe. Could I encourage you? This is not for you. It will be a completely worthless moment for you. I wouldn't take it. But here's the third possibility. You might be sitting here and you've had some 
insightful thoughts and you've tried to read some books that are, would challenge you and you, you've been around church maybe a little bit, enough to feel like you're a little bit religious and all those things like that, and you're sort of in this mode. You're tinted. I want to encourage you. It's not where God would have you to be at all. I can't encourage, I can't tell you that that faith is real. I can't. But I can tell you this, if that's you, right where you're at, in the silence of your own mind, you could ask God to forgive you. You could ask God to change you. You could ask God to come and dwell inside of you. We call that spiritual new birth. And then we'd invite you to take communion with us as a part of the family that remembers Jesus' death. The night before his death, Jesus pulled his disciples together. He was gonna go and die on a cross, have his blood shed, not to create this, but to create this. The scriptures tell us that he took bread and he broke it and he passed it around and he says, do this in remembrance of me. In verse 25 it says that after supper he took the cup and he passed it around and he said, drink this in remembrance of me. Father, may our hearts be right before you. May we fan into flame the faith and the gift that resides inside of us and not grow cold and not be moved by our fears, but be moved by your spirit in our lives, Lord. Move in us, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Your salvation. Your salvation was the key that brought you into his family. It was done not just to get you into heaven, it was done to transform your life, to keep you on fire, to allow you to be so different that you become obvious to the world that something dynamic has changed you. God bless you, let it be true of you.